Good morning. I welcome you. It is so good to be with you at the, the beginning of the week on the Sabbath day. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been <clears throat> teaching for the last hour and I knew my voice was going to probably falter here a little bit, but we'll push on through. I am so grateful for all of those who have prepared uh, to be a part of our service today. Sharon, the prelude was absolutely beautiful and it was just what I needed after an hour of teaching Sunday school. I love the Moonlight Sonata. I could listen to that over and over as well as the other pieces that you played. I'm happy to have Robin with us and Penny. And um, I'm gonna get to you, Jonathan. <laughs> I want to thank the, the, our technology people, uh, Karen, who's running our PowerPoint today, and Roxanne and Kanitha. Uh, care of it, but probably the most stressful job, far more stressful than standing up here and uh, talking, is running the technology that's involved in both having the, the PA system so that we can appreciate what's going on here in the sanctuary, but also the Zoom that can our brothers and sisters who are worshiping with us from, from home. Uh, the stress levels on these people in the last several months that we've been trying to come back to church and do this has been very, very high. And so we owe them uh, a deep debt of gratitude for uh, what they do for us. I'm happy that our speaker this morning is Jonathan Bacon. Um, Jonathan is one of the most loving and kind and caring people that I have ever encountered in my life. And I don't get up here at the same time that he's up here very say something like this, but since I'm, I'm up here today, I'm going to acknowledge that. I appreciate Jonathan so much, the ministry that you give, not only um, in your teaching and speaking, but also on a personal level. Um, he's such a patient human being and I aspire to be more like him. I'm not anywhere close yet. Uh, but he is an excellent role model. Uh, we actually have a connection that goes beyond Mission Road. Uh, his parents and my grandparents worshiped at the same uh, church, the same branch in Flint, Michigan, the Bristolwood branch. And I don't know, I, I suspect we may have been there and crossed paths at some time. Uh, when I was very young, we used to spend summers with my grandparents in Michigan. And of course, we went to church with them. I just don't know whether... Uh, Jonathan and I were ever at Bristol Wood on the same day, but I suspect probably were, but I'm always happy to think about that connection and imagine um, uh, his mom and dad and my grandparents all working together for the well-being of that little congregation up there. Um, I have a couple of announcements that I need to share with you. Uh, Karen Brown has asked me uh, to let you know that Saturday, November the 27th, uh, which will be the weekend of Thanksgiving. So following Thanksgiving at 9 a.m., we will meet here at the church to put up Christmas decorations. We missed out on this, I guess, last year because of COVID. I don't remember now what we did. Um, but it will be good to be back together and uh, have the church decorated and, and thinking about the um, Advent season a little bit. So that is the 27th at 9, if you can be here to help with that. Uh, there are availability sheets for 2022, as well as hard copy worship schedules for November and December available in the uh, fellowship hall. We'd like to have those availability sheets uh, so that's the same weekend. Um, we're changing a little bit how we're doing the quarterly schedule. A number of years ago, when I think when Nadine was uh, the administrative associate that worked for the congregation, uh, there was value in uh, having the quarters divided up uh, so that we went uh, September, October, November, and then we started a new quarter in December, January, February, because it coincided with newsletters and we could send the schedules out with the newsletter that way. But since Jonathan uh, has developed our newsletter system online uh, by email and by Facebook, uh, that need no longer exists. And so we're going to uh, go back to a more a conventional order system. And so we're now going to have you fill out the availability forms for January, February, March, and then so on. So that's why that has, has changed. So please uh, take care of those. Any other announcements? Anything else, Larry or Karen? Uh, Robin? Don't forget about our uh, Thanksgiving. 
giving donations. Okay. Is that and that's food, food items and so forth? Uh, no, we want uh, we're gonna give them okay. so that they can buy what they need for the Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we one year had three turkeys go bad in front because I didn't notice we had turkey before. <laughs> so okay. we just don't do that anymore and we just give them money right. so they can go to harvesters and buy what they need. And the donation that we give them will be for Christmas and um, Thanksgiving. Okay. And you can give uh, monetary donations to the World Church website on their e-tithe uh, under uh, Mission Road. There is a, a place where you can give to the Center for Hope. So uh, that's a very convenient way to do that if you, if you wish. Sarah, did you have anything else? Uh, we'll go ahead then, and I'm going to share our call to worship this morning. This is from a book called Prayers and Readings for Worship. We believe in the gathered community of faith. Through it, we learn to love and to value life. In it, we find acceptance. We believe in the wholeness of life. We're not intended to be split and divided as persons. We are created and set in a fractured world so that we can bring it to wholeness as well. We believe in one God expressed in three ways, creator, redeemer, and spirit. When we worship one, we acknowledge all. When we are troubled, God responds. We believe in the flow of life from birth through death into everlasting life. We cannot capture the wonder of life before God with explanations. We only know that God is with us. Please join us in singing together hymn number 101. Lord, we felt the welcoming presence of your spirit as we entered this place of sanctuary and peace this morning and listened to the beautiful music that was played. We're grateful that you have brought us safely through the week that is behind. We look forward to the week ahead, strengthened by the Sabbath fellowship with our friends and by the companionship of your spirit that invigorates empowers us. We pray your blessings upon this service as we worship together, and we ask that each one will find in this experience transformation and renewal. We thank you for the gifts of all those who will be sharing in this hour, and we pray that those gifts will be magnified by your love and grace in our sacred space today. We ask all of these things in the loving name of your Son, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We are all called to work diligently, establishing God's peaceable kingdom throughout our daily lives, where, wherever we are planted. God's peace must be alive, first inside of us, and then it will radiate out from us to our world around us learned. How we respond in anger is learned. I pray that each one of us, through our actions and reactions, will be positively displayed with God's goodness and graciousness displayed to the world. Please pray with me. Jesus, there is power in your name. You are the God of this universe, this planet, and this nation. You hold us in the palm of your hand. Thank you. May we live our lives loving in loving goodness, loving justice, and loving peace. And when we don't, prompt us to stop, seek forgiveness, and start again. May we feel deeply your call to renewal and wholeness and seeking peace among your people and beyond our own borders. May each one of us here respond with new commitment and purpose, with a sense of blessing and peace that comes from your holy grace and presence. with the power of the Holy Spirit throughout the world to bind up the brokenhearted, stand firm in what is good and right, 
and seeking to bring about your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Join with me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is done in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Suffer us not to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There were several scriptures that were included in the worship helps, and the one I've chosen to read this morning is from the Doctrine and Covenants, the section 161. This is uh, verse 1a and 3cd. Lift up your eyes and fix them on the place beyond the horizon to which you are sent. Journey in trust, assured that the great and marvelous work is for this time and for all time. And raises a question. What is your great and marvelous work? The scripture continues, be patient with one another, for creating sacred community is arduous and even painful, but it is to loving community such as this that each is called. Be courageous and visionary, believing in the power of just a few vibrant witnesses to transform the world. Be assured that love will overcome the voices of fear, division, and deceit. Which raises a question. Is this what Anne Frank meant when she wrote, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world? The scripture continues, understand that the road to transformation travels both inward and outward. The road to transformation is the path of the disciple, which then raises another question. What does it mean that the road to transformation travels both inward and outward? I want to thank Paul for his introduction. I only wish that I had the patience that he claims that I have. Um, in addition to the reading from the Doctrine and Covenants this morning, the primary scripture suggestion uh, for today's theme is from Mark, uh, 13th, verse, 13th chapter, verse through the 8th verse. Uh, yet there's no use of the phrase that is today's theme, wait patiently. The scripture from Mark details a moment in the life of Jesus when he was leaving the temple in Jerusalem with his disciples. That would be the second temple completed in 586 BCE, where Mary and Joseph had found Jesus in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and uh, asking them questions. When leaving the temple in Mark's record, one of the disciples says to Jesus, look, teacher, what massive stones what magnificent buildings. Jesus replies, not one stone will there be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. In a later conversation, private conversation with his uh, four of his disciples, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Jesus is asked when the destruction of the temple will occur. His response is that when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pangs, or in some versions it says birth pains. It's interesting that many folks have thought that those were the signs of the end of times. Jesus says just the option, opposite. They are the beginning of birth pangs. Birth pangs for what? What is he forecasting, prophesying that will come? Our first question is, what does the scripture have to do with the theme, wait patiently? 
If we're not being told to wait patiently for the end of times, what's the message? It might help to review the previous chapter of Mark, chapter 12. Jesus, and you, you know this story, Jesus is in the temple, and one of the scribes comes to him and asks, which commandment is the first of all? You know the rest of the story, but for review, Jesus answered, the first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But Jesus gives him two for one, two answers, two solutions to one question. The second commandment is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that God is one and there's no other but God and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all possible burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. As a side note, in the letter uh, to Hebrews, chapter 10, the author is very poetic. He uses very poetic language and writes, let us not consider how we may spur one another. God is there finally. Let, me, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. That letter is variously attributed to Paul or one of his followers. And it reinforces that second commandment to care for and encourage one another. In the temple story, in the temple story, in a prophetic sense, Jesus was for, foretelling the destruction of the second temple, which changed Judaism in several significant ways. First, it ended the practice of ritual sacrifice. Ritual sacrifice was performed in the temple. Without a temple, you can't have a ritual sacrifice. Second, the destruction of the temple broke the hold of the belief that God resided only in the Holy of Holies. The destruction led to the emergence of rabbinical Judaism, which moved the focus from the temple to the synagogue to how people could practice Judaism in their daily lives. So you see, there's a destruction in the temple that leads to a creation of a new approach to Judaic life. Finally, the destruction of the temple led to the development of the oral law to help interpret Jewish uh, uh, scripture. This was seen as necessary because many of the practices possible within the temple were no longer possible. The law had to be reinterpreted to accommodate the changing times. That's an approach a prophetic people must use today. I don't buy the view that Jesus' message was ever for us to wait patiently for the end of times, or to wait patiently for God to do his thing. Rather, I believe that God looks for our active involvement to make the world better. My mother often used the phrase during troubling times, this too shall pass. I often wondered where that saying occurred in the Bible, and it doesn't. It's an ancient Persian Sufi saying, and the fable of its origin goes like this. An Eastern monarch once charged his wise men to invent for him a sentence that should always be true and appropriate in all times and situations. They presented him with the words, and this too shall pass away. According to the fable, it is impossible to imagine a thought more truly and universally applicable to human affairs than those memorable words. They describe the perpetual oscillation from good to evil and from evil back to good, which from the beginning of the world has been characteristic of all times and all cultures. History details the strange mixture of noble and generous acts contrasted to base and selfish inclinations. 
History tells us of the rise and fall of good people and just kingdoms. That phrase eased my mother's soul during times that she called uh, trials and tribulations. While we were sometimes, so, while we sometimes need to wait patiently through uh, the storms of life, knowing that this too shall pass, I was brought up and in, influ influenced by Frederick Madison Smith, of all people, and his belief in the social gospel. Smith was known for his interest in applying the principles of the newly emerging fields of sociology and social welfare to the concept and principles of Zion. Smith was influ influenced by the contemporary social gospel uh, movement, which in endeavored to apply Christian ethics to social or societal problems, including social justice, uh, health care, care for the elderly, care for the poor, care for the orphans. In essence, Smith felt the need to address these issues as part of the overall call to build Zion. In this way, he both embraced and modernized his grandfather, Joseph Smith Jr.'s vision of Zion. In our day, F.M. Smith, his social gospel has morphed into the concept of a prophetic people and a loving community. So here is the only place that patience involves itself in this morning's message. I'm not a, I'm not a patient person, so I will try to get right to the point. Section 161 of Doctrine and Covenants used at this morning's scripture reading includes the words of the prophet and president W. Grant McMurray. And I'll repeat them again, part of it. Be patient with one another, for creating sacred community is arduous and even painful. Be courteous and visionary, believing in the power of just a few vibrant witnesses to transform the world. Be assured that love will overcome the voices of fear, division, and deceit. We've been studying First, the history of Christianity, and more recently, a history of God and the evolution of the concepts of monotheism in uh, the adult class. And that reminds me of the Hebrew concept of tikkun, tikkun olam. Tikkun means amending or fixing, while tikkun olam is a popular Jewish concept meaning mending the world. How do we mend the world? Let me start. Let me tell you a story. And I, uh, I hesitate to name the person involved, but I will, uh, because she's somewhat related to me. Um, the story is that yesterday morning, my daughter Jody goes to the local Lamar's donut store to pick up a dozen donuts. And they're, in essence, celebrating the end of the, the uh, football season. The ending wasn't as good as we wanted, but it was, it was an ending. Uh, it's 32 degrees out, and there's a line of 21 people waiting patiently, sort of, uh, because of social distancing, only six at a time are allowed inside, inside the shop. One lone girl, Sarah, is making the donuts, boxing and selling them. The crowd's getting testy, until Jody smiles and basically starts up a conversation by simply saying, this is quite a, quite a line. Soon fellow customers join in the conversation telling what their favorite donut is, hoping it'll be available when the, they reach the front of the line and sharing stories of why they came for donuts on that particular morning. One very unhappy woman um, says she's a dasher. That is, she works for DoorDash. After 30 years in corporate America, she now works as, the, as an Uber and DoorDash driver. Her client is on the phone and very angry at the delivery delay. As it turns out, Sarah, the clerk, is working all alone because two co-workers scheduled for Saturday have failed to show. So she's making the donuts, she's boxing them, she's selling them. Once everybody understands how hard Sarah is working, 
And while she's alone, they become more patient and understanding. There's an eight-year-old boy getting donuts with his parents to celebrate his soccer team's victory. He says to Jody, you talk to people you don't, don't even know. To which she replies, yes, isn't it fun to get to know the people you meet? As each of the patrons is admitted to the inside of the queue of six, the last person in, in line shares, sh Sarah's, shares Sarah's story, and the new person nods in understanding. On the way out of the store, Jody announces to the waiting crowd, Sarah's all alone today and doing the best she can to make and sell the donuts. Three thoughts come to mind. One person can create a positive chain reaction. Also, we never know the pressures bearing on other people and sometimes all it takes is a kind conversation to diffuse a difficult situation. The story reminds me again of the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, defined in Jewish teachings as any activity that improves the world, bringing it closer to the harmonious state for which it was created. Tikkun olam implies that while the world is innately good, the Creator purposely left room for us to improve upon His work. All human activities are opportunities to fulfill this mission, and every being can be involved in tigan, tigan olam. Child or senior citizen, student or entrepreneur, industrialist or artist, care to, caregiver or, sa or uh, salesperson, political activist, or environmentalist, customer, or clerk, or just any of us who are struggling to keep afloat. As Anne Fr Frank wrote, how wonderful it is that nobody need wait a single moment before starting to improve the world. That's the opposite of wait patiently. Don't wait. This opportunity too shall pass. Rage against the wrong. Fight the good fight. Invite, discover, respond, and reflect the four th phases of generosity cycle. We express gratitude for the discovered gifts we have received from a generous God. Receiving God's blessings leads us to, the longing, to longingly serve God. Serving God by serving others keeps us connected with God and connects us with each other. When we extend our lives in service to others, we learn that we receive even as we are giving. Giving and receiving integrates in a cycle where one prompts the other. We receive gifts, we share them with others, and the cycle continues. Our generosity is missional because it allows us to not only share the good news of the gospel with others, but to live out its message and bring forth that response from others. We are called to share generously and love abundantly, like Christ, so others can come to know God's love and grace. Tithing is a heartfelt response to God moving in our lives and calling us to share what we have received with others. Giving is about grace and is joy and a privilege. Every contribution is important to God, to the giver, and to the ministry of the church. Giver's generosity changes people's lives and brings joy as Christ's mission is realized. Our whole life stewardship lived out throughout the mission initiatives is how we further the whole mission of Jesus Christ. Christ's mission is our mission. Please pray with me. Compassionate Father, thank you that you are our strength and our song. Fill our hearts with joy. May we give our offerings to you with gladness and joy. Everything we have belongs to you, and we rejoice to give some of your abundant gifts back to you. Accept the gifts we place before you now. May the peace of God reign in our lives. The love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of God uphold us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May our touch be the embrace of compassion. 
May our spirits sense your abiding presence given us through Christ Jesus. Amen.